COVID didn't hit Kent as badly as elsewhere in the first wave, but it's here now, at least in pockets of the southeastern county. This is the high street in Sittingbourne in the borough of Swale. Now, Swale has the highest number of cases per week of COVID in England. Yet 30 miles away is Tunbridge Wells, which has below the national average number of cases per week. Yet because they are both in Kent, they will both go into tier three, the highest level once lockdown is lifted. There had been some hope that it would be applied by district or even by borough, but the government has rejected that idea. Nobody on this relatively quiet high street today seemed at all surprised at the three-tier announcement. We've had schools closed. I've had granddaughter. She's gone in, had two weeks off school, and she's gone in for one day, and then she's been sent home another. That's over on the Isle of Sheppey. Can't see getting any better for a little, little, um, a little bit longer, really till somebody gets their finger out. Or a vaccine? Yeah, or a vaccine. Do you think it's fair? No, probably not, but for safety, yes. You know, the, I mean, say, I think the Prime Minister's doing his best. Poor bugger, he's had a rotten year. The case numbers vary greatly across Kent and Medway. In Ashford and Tunbridge Wells, they are relatively low, yet they're up to four times higher in other parts of the county putting Kent's overall case rate at 277.8 per 100,000. The three prisons in the county, care homes, schools have all been blamed for the rise in numbers here, but the explanation is more complex. 85% of our infection rate is being generated in home ex uh, environments, people at home spreading it to each other. If one person in, in a house of five gets it, then three get it. The Prime Minister said this evening data will be published to explain the tiers each region is put into. But scientific advice has been that before lockdown, tier one at least did not have much impact. There were some calls for um, the tiers to be put into boroughs or districts rather than whole counties. Was there any way that sort of system could have worked? I think there are issues about what they call edge effects. So if the tier is, if the system is too small, if the local area is too small, um, you could just, you know, uh, go to the pub just down the road instead of the one that is closed or something like that. You know, so I do think there needs to be a certain size to them. The message remains protect the NHS and save lives. And with high numbers of COVID patients and Medway Trust, that feeds into the tier three decision. And there is also pressure and GP surgeries. Most patients can be seen um, by video consultation, which has um, gone down quite, quite well with most patients because they know that we're you know, keeping them safe. Um, and obviously there's the added pressure of having to put and don PPE and donning and off and on. And then we've also had problems with staff being off sick. Uh, coming into contact with um, members of their community that have been tested positive. Under Tier 3, more of these shops will be open after December the 2nd, but life will remain far from normal until the numbers start falling in this county. Victoria MacDonald. Well, I'm joined now by Professor Helen Stokes Lampard, Chair of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. Good evening. Professor Helen Stokes Lampard, yes, good evening. Um, has the lockdown worked from a medical point of view? From a medical point of view, certainly we are now just about starting to see the benefits. We're seeing the cases flattening off nicely. So that's the total number of people diagnosed. And gradually we are seeing the numbers of people admitted to hospital slowing down. Uh, the deaths are still a cause for concern, but there is always a lag. You get the cases diagnosed first, then a a couple of weeks later, people being admitted to hospital, and then a week or two after that, then deaths start to go up. Um, and so there's a clear pattern, it's a repeating pattern that we saw back in the spring. Uh, so yes, the lockdown is definitely starting to help just now. So, you know, three weeks in and we're starting to see the benefits. The hard thing is always looking ahead and planning. Uh, but obviously we have to do that. It's right for society. People need the hope of knowing what's coming next. People need to be able to plan. And yet only this week we've been reporting some figures, the death figures and even some of the infection figures back down to May, back up to May levels. 
Oh, absolutely. We are in a very serious situation. So whilst the lockdown has certainly started to help, it hasn't gone a long way to helping. It has just slowed things down a bit. And I think the gravity of our situation cannot be overstated from a medical point of view. You know, my mission is to ensure that we save as many lives as possible and we ensure that people who get the disease recover to live completely well lives afterwards. And we're a long way from that. So we have a large number of people getting the disease that's slowing down. Uh, it's vital that as restrictions are eased and although moving into tears may not feel like much easing, it is an easing. Um, and therefore we have to watch that the disease doesn't start to rise too dramatically again. But so the implications of what you say uh, is that in the tier three areas, the situation is very serious indeed. Yes. It is serious and, and you only have to look at what's happening in our GP surgeries, in our A&E departments, in our intensive care departments. You know, my colleagues are on their knees in many parts of the country. Just so let me explain. For the whole of England, we are at 95 percent capacity of intensive care beds. A safe critical care capacity is about 80 percent of beds being used at any one time. We're at 95 percent. The NHS is coping. My colleagues are stepping up and doing amazing work. But that's a very fine margin and that's on average. So that means there are some hospitals that are beyond what is safe that are having to transfer patients to other hospitals. And indeed, we're seeing a brilliant cooperation between units where people are being having to be transferred to different hospitals to ensure they keep getting safe care. So uh, well, does, that, does that explain why you've had to take the unprecedented step of opening uh, one of these extra hospitals uh, in Exeter, the Nightingale Hospital there? Uh, to deal with a, a COVID crisis? Yeah, so the southwest of England is very interesting. Compared to the rest of the country, the southwest has fewer hospital beds per head of the population, just as a baseline. So if you live in a big city like Manchester or London, you have there are far more hospital beds per person in the population than there are somewhere like the southwest. So although their numbers of cases aren't as bad as, uh, say, the Midlands are, um, actually their hospital pressures are significant. But the Nightingale Hospital down in Exeter was designed differently and is being used differently from perhaps the other hospitals in that it's um, it's a much more flexible unit. It has uh, capacity to do diagnostic work. So that's imaging uh, X-rays and scans and so on. They have got some intensive care capacity there, but they've also got some COVID wards there, more general wards. Many of the other Nightingales are only designed to take ventilated patients. Um, and actually, mercifully, we're not needing those uh, as it happens. But yes, Exeter is a kind of case on its own and, and you know that people are doing great work down there.